Our reading this morning is chosen by John. Uh, it's called The Stream of Life by, Br- Br- I'll say it again, Rabindranath Tagore, um, who, funnily enough, is uh, my, my mother who died in um, 1995. She went to school in North Wales, and Rabindranath Tagore visited the school when she was a schoolgirl. So... Uh, my mother had a book of his, um, of his writings, so it's lovely to read something for Rabindranath Tagore this morning. It's called The Stream of Life. The same stream of life that runs through veins night and day, runs through the world and in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass, and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that has rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and of death in ebb and flow. I feel in my limbs a maid of glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. The second reading chosen by John is The Modern Genesis by William Jelly. Uh, Many of the older members will know that William Jelly was our first minister and he arrived here in 1900. I think his photograph is still um, in what used to be the, um, the minister's office. As soon as science made it clear that the authority of scripture was shattered, Unitarians transferred the seat of authority in religious matters to the human mind and soul. A thing had only to be proven true to be the satisfaction of our souls, and we were prepared, nay, pledged, to adopt it into our religion. And now we are able to see that the Bible of nature is in reality a far larger book of revelation than the old Bible ever was. We have only exchanged a small book for an infinitely large one, a book of the past for a a book of the past for present and future, a book of one race for a book of all humanity, nay of all life and creation. For what is nature? Nature is only a comprehensive name, like God, meaning all things that are, and ever have been, and ever will be. The Bible of nature is the universe which lies open in all directions for us to read, and we have eyes to see. I will now introduce our speaker this morning. I've introduced John before, but as many of our newer church members will not know John as well as some of our older members. As I mentioned in John's last talk, talk, his involvement with our church goes back to 1984. Over the years, John has been a regular participant in several volunteer positions in our church and now regularly joins us from Wellington via Zoom. The title of his talk this morning, as I've already mentioned, is Charles Darwin, Seen of the Darwin and Wedgwood families, passionate student of nature and the change that he brought into our self understandings. Welcome, John, to us from Wellington. Charles Darwin, who lived through the middle years of the 1800s, is familiar to most of us as the man who laid the foundations of the modern theory of evolution. His ideas have had dramatic continuing effects on our view of ourselves and of the world of which we are part. The idea that living things shared a common evolutionary heritage was not new. What was new was the mechanism that Darwin, along with Alfred 
Russell Wallace, who came up with very similar ideas uh, at around the same time, proposed. Darwin worked his arguments into a book of almost 500 pages that was widely read and finally carried the day in the world of science. It's a, carefully assembly, it's a careful assembly of evidence from animal breeding, from geology, and from the way that different life forms are distributed across different continents and islands. It was not, as had earlier been suggested, that giraffes stretched their necks to reach the high branches for food, with their offspring then inheriting their stretched necks. Instead, occasional newborn had long necks that allowed them to reach up to leaves on high branches on acacia or other such trees and were more, more likely to survive and pass on their long necks. Accidents of nature lead to changes in the offspring and if they survive to have offspring, those changes will be inherited. The changes will be driven in different directions in different environments in a process termed adaptive radiation. Or to tell the story another way, some beetles have green offspring and some brown offspring. There'll be some places where the green baby beetles are seen by birds and do not survive. In others, the green baby beetles will survive better. Finches with unusually long beaks that are adapted to eating the cactus plants on some of the Galapagos Islands are an interesting example. Darwin had no knowledge of the mechanism by which variations, mutations as we call them today, occur. Starting in the 1950s, scientists have been able to tease out many of the chemical instruction sets. We have only a limited understanding of how the instruction sets operate to generate a life form. The fertilized egg from which I started, taking half its instructions from my mother and half from my father, would have been the size of a large speck of dust. In the crude way that such comparisons are commonly done, about a tenth of a percent varies between different humans. We share just under 99% of our instruction set with chimpanzees. With pigs, it's 98%. With bananas, it's 60%. Small differences in the instruction set can make a huge difference in the living organism that results. I think it absolutely amazing that a mother's reproductive apparatus can take a fertilized egg that's a bit bigger than that's a larger size of um, sorry that's the size of a larger speck of dust, and turn it into a living, breathing human being. Francis Collins, who led an exercise that came up with the first draft of the human instruction set in two thousand and three, wrote a book in which he described it as the language of God. Whether or not you buy that it is indeed the language that creates new life forms of every kind, and indeed humans. I was privileged to be part of a group at Australian National University that worked over the published paper that described the rough first draft of the human instruction set when it appeared in 2003. Darwin <clears throat> had a remarkable and very privileged family background his two grandfathers were both remarkable people in their own right. On his mother's side was Josiah Wedgwood, technocrat, experimentalist, and businessman who took a cottage pottery industry and transformed it into an international business enterprise. It still operates under the name Wedgwood today. Josiah's mother had brought her children up with values taught by her father, who held that knowledge based on reason, experience, and experiment were preferable to dogma. Sounds a bit like some of the statements that Unitarians make, and indeed, Josiah and his family were prominent Unitarians. 
Josiah was prominent in the anti-slavery movement. He made and gave away large numbers of his famous anti-slavery medallion, where a kneeling African in chains asks, Am I not a man and a brother? Grandfather Erasmus Darwin was a doctor, a religious radical, an inventor, and a poet. His son Robert, who was Charles Darwin's father, was a well-to-do doctor. At least two of Erasmus's inventions were aids to Josiah in his pottery business. Among his inventions was a steering mechanism for his carriage that would be adapted for use in cars 130 years later. So on then to Charles Darwin. At an early age, he developed a passion for collecting things, including insects and beetles. The education that he received at the Anglican boarding school in Shrewsbury, where he was sent from ages 8 to 16, was too narrow and classical for his taste. The boys were not supposed to waste their time on beetles. The experience did very likely shape the relatively orthodox religious views that he formed as a young man. After school, then what? Darwin's father sent him at age 16 to study as a medical student at Edinburgh University. The intellectual atmosphere was free thinking in a way that Oxford and Cambridge were not. D Darwin took it all in his stride. It was a, of a piece with the sorts of discussions that went on among his family and their social circle, but a lot of it must have passed over him. He spent a great deal of time in field trips with two mentors who were free thinkers and learned a great deal of biology. But medicine was not to Darwin's taste. He couldn't stand blood or watching operations. So, what then? Now, Charles's free thinking father was an accommodating man and expected his son to be likewise accommodating. Perhaps he sensed that Darwin was, sorry, perhaps he sensed that Charles was moving in a religiously orthodox direction. However it was, Robert proposed that Charles would go to Cambridge University and study to be a clergyman. Here is how Charles described his reaction. I had scruples about declaring my belief in all the dogmas of the Church of England, though otherwise I liked the thought of being a country clergyman. Accordingly, I read with care Pearson on the Creed and a few other books on divinity, and as I did not then in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible, I soon persuaded myself that our creed must be fully accepted. It never struck me how illogical it was to say that I believed in what I could not understand and what is, in fact, unintelligible. Anglican orthodoxy had won out over radical family influences. One of the texts that Charles was required to study at Cambridge was Paley's Evidences of Christianity. This made an analogy between a watch found on the beach and the intricate workings of nature. A watch, even an imperfect watch, was evidence of a maker. Surely the same had to be true for the amazing works of nature. Charles wrote, The logic of this book, and, it, and as I may add of his natural theology, gave me as much delight as did Euclid. I did not at that time trouble myself about Paley's premises, and taking these on trust, I was charmed and convinced by the long line of argumentation. And in fact, uh, it, when he wrote um, articles and papers in his book later, Charles took uh, pa pa Paley's style of um, argumentation as a model for the way he wrote himself. Charles Darwin's major focus of attention was once again on the study of nature, a sideline to his Cambridge BA studies. 
lectures and field trips with the botany professor John Henslow were his joy and delight. He made himself into a research and teaching assistant, Henslow. Darwin's skills as a budding researcher clearly impressed Henslow. Just as Darwin was about to leave Cambridge, Henslow was offered the role of naturalist and companion to Captain Robert Fitzroy on the Beagle, whose job would be to chart out the sea channels and sea routes uh, along the South American coast and elsewhere. Henslow's response was to recommend Darwin. His father was initially opposed, but Uncle Josiah, this is Josiah II, whose daughter Darwin would marry, persuaded Robert that this was a great opportunity for this young man of enlarged curiosity. Thus started a journey that would have world-shattering consequences. Here at last was a challenge for which Darwin was an ideal fit. He was a, a relatively orthodox Christian believer when at age 22 in 1831, he joined the Admiralty ship the Beagle as its naturalist. What was supposed to be a two year journey extended to five. The journey would take him among other places to South America, to Australia and New Zealand. He spent 10 days over Christmas 1836 in the Bay of Islands, finding New Zealand not a very pleasant place. Papers and articles on Darwin's investigations into geology, plants and animals had already been widely circulated before he arrived back in England in 1836 and had acquired some fame on that account. Ahead of him was the task of completing the writing up. But he was nagged by the question, how did these various life forms so often come to be fitted in their different ways for the places where they were found? By 1838, it's two years after he arrived back in England, Darwin had convinced himself that evolution was real and that it proceeded by a process of natural selection. It would be another 20 years before he presented his one long argument, as he put it, to the general public. He worried about how his ideas would be received. Among the few trusted scientific friends with whom he discussed his ideas was Joseph Hooker. Eight years after returning on the Beagle and four months after Hooker had returned from his own four-year journey down into Antarctic seas, Darwin wrote to Hooker, At last gleams of light have come, and I am almost convinced, quite contrary to the opinion I started with, that species are not, it is like confessing a murder, immutable. I think I have found out, now here's presumption, the simple way by which species become exquisitely adapted to various ends. You will now groan and think to yourself, on what a man have I been wasting my time in writing up? I should five years ago have thought so too. Actually, it was more like um, seven years ago that Darwin would have thought so too. As he assembled the evidence from his researches into the fossils and plants and animals that he had found and the way that they were distributed, Darwin felt that an evolutionary explanation was forced on him. Hooker was interested and wanted to hear more. Hooker became one of a small circle of scientific colleagues with whom Darwin discussed his evolving understanding. In 1859, Darwin's Origin of Species presented his carefully argued conclusions to the general public. It created great controversy, but slowly the scientific community, the general public, and even most of the clergy were won over. It helped that Darwin was careful to hide his own religious views. 
more about that in three weeks' time. When he died in 1882, the death of this great Christian gentleman, as he was described, was mourned in pulpits up and down the land. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, next to Isaac Newton and astronomer John Herschel. Alfred Russell Wallace commented that Darwin had wrought a greater revolution in human thought within a quarter of a century than any man of our time, or perhaps any time. He has given us a new conception of the world of life and a theory which is itself a powerful instrument of research, has shown us how to combine into one consistent whole the facts accumulated by the separate classes of workers, and has thereby revolutionised the whole study of nature. In, a, in um, his book, The Descent of Man, published in 1871, Darwin wrote that man, with all his noble qualities, with sympathy which feels for the most debased, with benevolence which extends not only to other men, but to the humblest living creature, with his godlike intellect which has penetrated into the movements and constitution of the solar system, with all these exalted powers, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. Unfortunately, humans have not just noble qualities, but as a race, some very ignoble qualities. What, what then lies ahead? Human knowledge has advanced to a point where do we, we are to an unprecedented degree in charge of our own density, uh, destiny. We today have been and are creating the environment in which the generations that follow will grow up. There has been much that is good. In most parts of the world, family sizes have reduced dramatically. Public health measures and modern medicine ensure that most children survive beyond childbearing age. It's a temporary respite. Warming, a warming and increasingly stormy planet is already upon us. It's bringing ever increasing numbers of forest fires, increasingly severe storms, floods, heat waves, and widespread displacement of the large part of the world's population that lives in low-lying areas. Add widespread pollution from plastic and other refuse and wars that are waged with ever more ferocious weaponry, one has to ask, when will we ever learn? Hymn 138, in, in singing the living tradition, has verses which I find a bit puzzling. These things shall be a loftier race than e'er the world hath known shall rise, with flame of freedom in their souls and light of science in their eyes. They shall be gentle, brave and strong to spill no drop of blood but dare all that may plant man's lordship firm on earth and fire and sea and air. These are noble thoughts, but they do appear to envisage a loftier race replacing the present race of humans. If that's indeed what is intended, it's not much help in the here and now. The challenge is to do better with humans as we are now. At this point, we move to group discussion. The questions I'm suggesting are, what gives you hope for the human future? What fills you with foreboding? What can we do to help create a better world for our children and grandchildren? They're very challenging questions. Thank you. John, thank you. As usual, one of your most wonderful, well-researched and very well presented um, talks that we will continue in a fortnight or so's time. <clears throat> Our closing words, 
As we enter another week of uncertainty in the world, let us remember that is only one side, that of humanity and planet Earth. May we pray for peace. May we raise our voices with our elected officials and engage as we can in active resistance. And may we remember to take very good care. May those words serve for extinguishing our chalice.